Good afternoon, family and friends. Pastor Kevin Quailchild Rodriguez here, Living on the Rock Ministries. Uh, we're going to get right into today's uh, message and the word of the Lord and the title that the Lord had placed in my heart for the sermon title today is Sincere Repentance. Sincere Repentance. So if you would, uh, turn with me to the second book uh, or the second Chronicles, chapter 7. We're going to read from verses 12 through 16 to guide us into today's prayer for the word to prepare our hearts. Amen. The word of the Lord reads, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Hallelujah. Andy, can you get the door closed, please? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to open up our heart here today that as we Get prepared for the message that you've laid on my heart. Anoint these lips of clay. But Lord, may your fruitful seeds be deposited into our heart to take deep root. Lord, you are the rock of salvation. You are the foundation of our life, oh God. Encourage us to mount ourselves and, and that when we come before your presence, to have a lifestyle of repentance, encourage us to repent sincerely to you, Lord. Because only can you turn all the wickedness around for our good, to channel it, to lead us towards you, oh God. We've done so much within our life, oh God. 46 years of age, and I know that I've done many things that were wrong, some things that were good, but it was only by your grace that when I would humble myself and realize that I needed you, that you would turn this wicked man, this wretch of a vessel, to you, O oh God, that you came close when I made that plea to you and I repented. Lord, thank you for teaching me to repent sincerely. Here today, I encourage that every online viewer, my family, and those who are attending services here today, Father, that you would encourage us to get deeper in our relationship with you, an intimate relationship with you, and to repent sincerely, because only by your grace can the blood of Jesus cover us and direct us and guide us into the newness that you have for our lives. So here today, Lord, nothing that manifests do we glory in the flesh, but Father God, we deflect all our praise, all our honor, all our glory to you in the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 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 Hallelujah. Today's message was uh, inspired by one of my students several years back. This student happened to be a young female teenager, she was, uh, she was one of the most um, unbelieving, uh, skeptical students of the class. But one thing that this student had was honesty, and she was, she was willing. She was willing to learn. She asked a lot of questions. Well, they, I happened to preach on a very similar sermon as this, where we would have our Vietnamese youth church uh, group uh, sing the worship songs at this really was church that was in the heart of a homeless ministry. The, the heart of this church was homeless ministry. And we got to watch our youth group go before probably a hundred homeless people who were bussed into the church where I was uh, asked to hold this service that night and preach on a humble repentance, and that night, the, the girl who uh, inspired me to preach on this today in the season and what we're seeing, I'll get more into that here shortly, 
She was the first one during worship. She was broken before the presence of the Lord. Never felt the Holy Spirit, was very honest about that. But she was the first one that she had to lay her mic down, walk off the steps while she was weeping, and she went to her chair. And when I was in worship, I was getting my heart prepared for the message that the Lord placed on my heart to deliver. And my wife nudged me, and she pointed at my sister, the student. And I saw her weeping. And I just felt an immense love of God that God was doing a good work in her heart. God was healing some things. I believe there were prayers being answered in that moment where we would go to our secret place and even pray for souls. And her soul was certainly one of them that I prayed for. I prayed for all my students. But that brokenness brought a healing. She happened to be, after I delivered the message that night, and I did a very quick message, it was only maybe a half an hour message. When I called the altar call, which God gave me vision, it was going to be a two-part altar call. God gave me the vision that it was going to be a mighty move of God. There was, I don't think, other than the homeless people who were in wheelchairs, not one homeless person that was in the pew, not dead on, right there on their face, dying of their flesh, repenting before the Lord in that place. And I would begin to watch this sister went first face down at the altar. And, and shortly after that, I'm, I'm observing in the spirit. And I see our senior pastor bawling before the presence of the Lord. It was a beautiful and magnificent moment. But I'm here to tell you that God is a good God. And if we could learn to adopt repentance, sincere repentance, into our lifestyle, that it would be a tool that we use daily. I'll put myself on blast. I had a dream last night, and it was not a good dream. And I woke up this morning repenting of my dream, because wicked things can even happen in our dream if we're not careful. And wicked things will continue to manifest if we allow ourselves to pervertedly keep our mind fixed on that and, and fantasize of these things, because what can be uh, contained within the vessel and brought under the blood immediately, even our thoughts, if we're not careful, we'll allow full manifestation where it fully manifests in the physical. Repentance, I have learned, especially having been saved now for 10 years, repentance is a tool that God says, look, just tap into my grace when you need it. And that is my plea here today, is that we be encouraged to sincerely, in our places, wherever we're at, we're at work, we're in our uh, living rooms, we're in our bedrooms, we're, we're in the shower, Put every matter of evil thought, every matter of wrongdoing under the blood. Tap into the grace of God immediately. Don't, don't wait for the next day, oh, I'll, I'll repent tomorrow. No, if you know that you have done such a thing, do it right then and there. Because it's, God wants to quicken our response out of sincere, out of sincerity, out of humility, he wants to quicken our response to repentance. Amen. Amen. So, as I would begin to think about today's uh, service and the sermon that the Lord would put on my heart, this sister of mine who, who I taught for several years in the youth class at the Vietnamese church that we were attending, <clears throat> I knew this song right here was actually the song that was put on my heart because this was her favorite song. And it just so happens to talk about, you know, being baptized in the river. And what that symbolizes is the blood of Jesus covering us from head to toe and washing us white as snow. So it's very fitting the message that the Lord placed on my heart today. And as I would begin to reflect and pray and prepare my heart, we're living in an in a hour right now where more evil is, is 
taking place before our eyes. More wickedness, less shame. I mean, people have no shame today. You, you go shopping at Walmart and people will bump into your cart, not even say sorry or excuse me and just keep on going. Like, it's just so shameful. There's no shame. This is where in the Word of God, we're, we're, we're watching before our eyes that, that we're losing the characteristics. We've become so callous, so hard-hardened in our hearts that we can't even think of, uh, uh, of the things that once used to shame us. We don't even have that no more. And shame, the gospel is not to shame us, and that means that it's not there to keep you in shame. But shame is a tool for a temporal purpose. It allows you to feel the contrition, the spirit of contrition to say, I realize I made a mistake here, and I feel bad for that. But when our heart is so hard that we don't feel that way no more, there's no contrition in our spirit, we are hardened. And just like in the book of Daniel, it talks about, and I'm, I'm going to get a little bit into this as we get into the scriptures here today. But God spoke into my spirit late last year, coming into this new year. The edging, the creeping in of the abomination that causes desolation. This is spoken of in the book of Daniel. It's spoken in some of the Gospels. And it's referred to even in the book of Revelation. And when you think of something that is uh, abominable, it's something detestable. In the, it's something vile in the sight of God. And we see the character of God through Jesus, that when Jesus went into the holy temple, to find church folk selling goods, right, for a profit, the love of money in the house of God. This is the one place that we saw Jesus so stirred, so aggressive in his behavior because usually Jesus was so merciful and graceful, but this was the detestable thing that was so vile in his sight because it was abominable. And the same thing that was spoken of in the book of Daniel, the abomination that causes desolation, it is where the, the, the desecration of God's holy temple will be defiled in the sight of the Lord. And I don't know what that fully looks like. I don't know anybody. I don't know any scholar that knows that fully. But you see the character of Jesus being so stirred in his heart that when he saw this abominable activity, the love of money in the church house that he overturned a table and even cracked whips. But even that was not a quick to anger. That was a slow to anger because Jesus had known the Old Testament from the beginning. He is the word. It became flesh and dwelt among us. But, but the slowness finally came to its peak and we see the character of Jesus. And he says, you know, you have made this place, my dad's place of worship, a den of robbers. And we see the character of this. So when, when Jesus and when God is speaking, this abomination is creeping in right now. We have some justice system. We get some justice, but overwhelmingly we're seeing injustice in our face. But thank God we can see some justice. Some things, some families getting justice for their murdered black child, for example. But in other cases where a young man who wasn't even uh, uh, fit to have legally a, a, a firearm, that in the same United States of America you get some justice over here using the same judicial system, but in another state they let a guilty man go. Now for the guilty who were convicted in court, at least, at least, they're going to go somewhere where they can get close to God. And I believe that some of these folks, right, like in the Aubrey case where they, they, they corral this black man running on the street and white men stopped him and in minutes this black man is murdered. These white men have a chance to repent. They have a chance to see Aubrey in heaven too. I believe that. They made a, a bad 
mistake. But I think of their souls too. I believe that they will have a chance to repent because they're going to go to a place where they can think for a very long time for their actions. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that that supremacy spirit that was so infiltrating their heart for however long it was, that they'll be healed from that thing. And at least, like what Jesus says, I would rather you go into heaven maimed than go to hell with your body perfectly intact. And I think that's fitting. But what an abominable thing that justice happened over here, but in a different state. Injustice happens over here. Two men died. One man dismembered for all the rest of his life and unguilty. Set free. My concern here is the conceitedness that you see on the faces of those, not just this young man who is now, what, 18, 19 years old? but the many who support him and exalt him. Conceitedness right now is doing a great devastation on the land. This abomination that causes desolation, conceitedness is causing a lot of destruction. And although I would love to see this young man, right, Rittenhouse, I believe is his name, in heaven one day, I'm very concerned because I see him garmented with conceitedness. Not one tear in court was it shed for others that he had murdered, but just for himself. Shameful, detestable, in the sight of the Lord. Human sacrifices at the Travis Scott concert. The abomination that causes desolation is creeping in. But in the midst of all of this, the good news is we can be inspired by the word of God. We can turn from our unrighteousness, plead to God and he will hear from heaven and he will heal us. A lot of innocent blood that has been shed, but you know what? It can start right now that we start to repent sincerely before our heavenly father that he would listen to us and help to turn us from our unrighteousness. See, repentance leads us away from that thing that we were doing that we knew that was wrong in our conscience. It helps to turn us from that thing. Word of God doesn't say how many times you, you, it'll, it'll grant you the turning. But here's one thing I do know, just like King David. He, went, he repented his way into heaven. I teach my children that. I teach all those in my midst because, hey, huh, I was a vile, uh, wicked man myself. And only the blood of Jesus saved me. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that can save you. God says, even to the wicked do I want to even see the wicked die? Wouldn't I rather them repent and turn from their wicked ways and live. God doesn't just love those who are just. <laughs> he doesn't just love those who are holy. He doesn't just love those who think they're so religious. He loves even his wicked children. Why? We're his creation. We're his most prized creation. So as we start to go into this, 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 this word today, you know, this is the time that we're living in. But the good news is we don't have to be a part of the wickedness taking place. And we can allow God through repentance, sincere, divine devotion to God. Lord, have mercy on this soul. I'll go a step further. In the Gospels, we learn of a parable that Jesus spoke of, of a man who was praying and saying, God, thank you that I'm not like this person over here who does all these wicked things. And thank you, Lord, that uh, I have this and I have this. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these uh, homeless people and these drug addicts. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like them. 
goes on to say in the parable, there was a man who went before the Lord and was banging his chest. Lord, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on this sinner right here. Banging his chest out of humility, witnessing before the presence of the God, knowing that he was a sinner. Jesus told his disciples, the one who pounded his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, walked away from that sanctuary more justified than the one who thought he was all that and a bag of, of chips. God has mercy and grace to cover us no matter how vile we think we are, but we got to tap into his grace. So my plea today is to be encouraged not to delay the response to repent, but to learn to quicken your lifestyle, to, to tap into God's grace as soon as you know you've done something wrong. Amen. Amen. Thank God he gives us a tool called repentance that we can use. And none of the things that we've done in the past will be remembered going forward. Every time we can just learn to repent and then allow God to do a good work. Not just to repent, to, to uh, exhaust or to take for granted His grace, but truly allow the miraculous, supernatural power of His grace, His covering, to do a good work in you. It will turn you from your unrighteousness. True repentance means it's a turning away of that sinful thing that you did, that I've done. It's a turning away. And Jesus doesn't even tell his disciples that there's a cap to this. He says there's no number. Yeah, he talked about seven times 70, but Jesus was getting at. There's no number to forgive. That if someone asks you to forgive them, if they say sorry, you must forgive them. How much more the grace of God, the Father, of the creator of all mankind, how much more will he share that grace when we sincerely go to him? And repent. That's good news, brothers and sisters. That's very good news. So as we get into Psalm 51 here today, we're going to read Psalm 51. And it's going to bless our heart. Because even though David did what he did, even though David covered up, tried to cover up his sin, he coveted another man's, a God-fearing man's wife, Right? He did so much things leading up to even the murder of a God-fearing man. That's vile in the sight of the Lord. God was no longer getting a hold of King David, so what did God do? He sent the prophet Nathan to get a hold of him. And I believe there's some of us today that need a prophet Nathan in our lives to get a hold of us. And that's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. That even though God's voice may not be getting to you, he'll use a human being to put the physical matter right in your face so that you can't deny the grace of God. He'll put that physical thing in your face so that you cannot deny his grace. But this represents, this Psalm 51 represents a very sincere and contrite heart, a man who felt temporarily shameful for what he'd done because God used the prophet Nathan to speak life and to wake up that spirit in him that had become hard. It can happen to any of us. And the minute we think that we can't allow Hard heart to happen to us. I don't care how long you've been pastoring behind the pulpit, hello. I don't care how long you've been speaking in tongues. I don't care how long you've been prophesying and things coming to pass. It can happen to any of us. And when we think that it can't happen to us, it's probably because it's really close to happening to us. So let's let the fear of the Lord set into our hearts to keep us scared straight. In the mighty name of Jesus. 
Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Psalm 51. And the word of the Lord reads, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, with an S, and my sin is always before me, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop. And I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, my sins, and blot out my iniquity. Create in me, O oh God, a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me. From the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. And burnt offerings offered whole, then bulls will be offered on your altar. See, we see here, King David realized that after Nathan spoke life into his spirit, after Nathan got a hold of David, that you know, what you did was so wrong and vile and don't think that God didn't see that. David woke up. He turned from what he had done. And even though the product of his sin, the product of his sin was death, the word of God is very clear on this. You know, the wages of sin is death. It is a separation between us and God. But the tool that God used even for David here, as he sincerely repented, sincerely and with a humble heart, with a contrite heart, he, he went to, before God. And even though his, his, his child, the product of his sin, the product of his, his adultery, the product of fornication was the death to his baby. Even though he went before the Lord and he, he, he rolled in ashes and he got into sackcloth and he, he was praying to God and he fasted, God said, no, I'm taking your baby. And you, got, you can't do nothing about it. But David, once the baby was dead, there was nothing David could do but get up out of his slumber. Get up out of his situation. See, this is where shame don't keep you held down. David ended up marrying Bathsheba. And the next child that they would bear together was King Solomon. And King Solomon is, is known for the most wise man on this earth. So when proper order came into the household, God brought proper order spiritually and blessed David blessed Solomon spiritually. 
And this speaks to our life now. We may be in a lot of disorder. We may be dysfunctional in these things. But we go before the presence of the Lord. And we repent like King David. And God begins to restore our life. Brings children back into our lives that were separated from us. Heals us from sickness by His grace and by His grace alone. Keeps us covered so that we aren't getting sick. Brings about a perfect operation in the chest to bring a perfect repair of the heart. Continuously keeps me reminded that I can fall short if I'm not careful. As a minister, don't be so, the word of God says, don't be so conceited. Don't be so confident in yourself alone, lest you fall. And that just means that like anybody else, I could fall. King De or, uh, uh, Apostle Paul put it like this. God keeps a thorn in my flesh to keep me from being conceited. There's a lot of conceitedness in the world today. And that, my brothers and sisters, is dangerous, especially in this time and hour where God's judgment is upon the lands. Make no mistake, this pandemic wasn't set for no reason. But the word today, even in 2 Chronicles, that we would learn that if we would turn from our wickedness and cry out to God and repent, will God not hear from our plea and heal our land? How much more do you think it's so important when the abomination that's about to cause desolation is creeping in closer and closer? Amen. Repentance is important. Repentance is Needs to be, a, there's got to be a quickening. Repentance must be our daily plea to God. If it ain't a thought and it's something you fully manifested, trust me, brothers and sisters, repentance is important. Allow the Spirit of the Lord to quicken that matter of your lifestyle, to repent whenever something you did wrong before the presence of the Lord. And as you get into your word, and maybe there are some things that you've done ignorantly, and that's not a bad word. Ignorance just means you didn't know you were doing something that you did. There are many times that I was sinning before God and I didn't even know that I was sinning. But once we know the light starts to shine, it starts to change us because we must then come into compliance. But today's message is more upon the intentional sins, the intentional things that we think about. Even a little too long. Dream, even like last night, I had a dream. It was a, it was a, a nasty dream. Thank God I would wake up and immediately repent. I don't have to know where it came from. It happened, and even the Word of God says, even in your dreams, you will do wicked things. That's sin. In your dreams. God says, the tool is, repent. And I'll make you white as snow, just like King David says here. He knew that back then the cleaning agent was hyssop, but now we don't need a cleaning agent. We don't have uh, uh, animal sacrifices no more. In the Old Testament, we did. <laughs> but the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb, already died on the cross, so now we tap into that grace. Right now, we don't need a high priest. And we let his blood cover us and make us white as snow, as it was saying here, for the hyssop. The blood of Jesus is now the cleaning agent for us. And we can tap into that thing whenever we want to. We don't have to wait for a man to do this great ceremony or nothing. No, 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 no. Right there. God wants to take you right now where you're at in your sinful nature. And it's so crazy to me how much people think they've got to clean themselves up before they actually repent. And that's the most Biggest lie of the enemy, and so many people, you go to the streets and you, you, you talk to them. They feel like they got to clean themselves up first in order to get right with God. You can't do it. It cannot be done. Us alone, on ourselves, in our own strength, we can't clean ourselves up. We need the grace of God. So just like uh, Billy Graham would always speak of, come as you are. Come to the feet of Jesus as you are. In your sinful nature as you are. Even King David said, look, what Adam and Eve did, it, 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 it cursed me even 
while I was in the womb of my mother. We can't get away from sin nature. We're human beings. It's a curse. But what can break that curse is the repentance now. God gives us that through the sacrifice of the perfect lamb uh, offering of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And his blood now, we can tap into the uh, precious blood of Jesus. That's my plea here today, brothers and sisters. As we get into this new season, 2022, in Jesus' name I pray, let the quickening of our repentance be a part of our lifestyle. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. That's my plea. That's my plea. That's my plea for my children. That's my plea for my disciples. That's my plea for anybody that I come into encounter with. Tell them about the good news of Jesus. That is my plea. Let's get close to God. Amen. We're going to pray out here today. We're going to get into the book of Ezekiel. And I believe in the mighty name of Jesus. This book and what we talk about in terms of repentance, what it truly means. Don't take my word for it. You don't even have to take my testimony for it. Even though my testimony and like all your testimonies mixed with the blood of Jesus, it is activated Holy Ghost filled power that will help to relate with other people. It will help to lead people to Christ. Yes, it will. But the word of God, there's nothing more powerful than the word of God to bring conviction, but also to bring us hope and a destiny and a plan. Amen. There's no sin other than one, and we don't even have to talk about that, but there's no sin that God cannot wash away with his blood. And we're going to get into a scripture, even found in the Old Testament, that speaks to the character of our Father in heaven on the matter. You don't need to take my word for it, but take the Spirit of the Lord's word for it in Bible. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 18. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. We're going to be reading from verses 21. <clears throat> 24. And the word of the Lord reads, But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to pause here. Whenever God's talking about life and death in this context, best believe and know and understand in the mighty name of Jesus that life means life eternal. And death means death consigned to hellfire. These are the two places for our souls. There's only two places for our souls. Heaven and hell. And every one of our souls, whether we think that we signed contracts and, and sold our soul to the enemy, not even that cancels the contract of creator that he has over your life. The devil uses that to, to, to make people even in the uh, entertainment industry bound in chains thinking that their soul now belongs to the enemy. No. Nope. Our souls belong to God, and God is over death and hell. And that means that he is the Lord over death. He's the Lord over life. He's over it all. And that means that he can cancel your contract with the enemy if you turn from your unrighteousness and turn to him. I don't know who that's for today. That's for somebody. I know it's for me too. In Jesus' name. Verse 22. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Grace. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Does God take pleasure in the wicked dying, declares the sovereign Lord, rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? However vile, however detestable, however dirty you think you are, 
the blood of Jesus will cover that and it will be remembered no more. God is saying, my grace will cover you. You will be recognized. You will be sealed with my love because you were repented. You turned from your wickedness and you're now following me. That means uh, repentance is a sign of obedience too. It means when you screw up, you repent. That's what keeps us in the will of God. Amen. 24. But if a righteous person, listen, if a righteous person turn, turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does not the same and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness, they are guilty of, of and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. Some people start the ministry on fire and in love with God. Prophesy for the glory of God to edify the body of Christ. Some people are, are apostles over regions to, to go and, 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 and they were called and destined for a, a thing. To speak life into the community. Or teachers or counselors. Once on fire for God. And I've seen this. I'm writing on this. And it scares me straight. But those who are close to God, who then become wicked, lovers of money, Jesus says, look, be careful not to love money. And we know there are a few examples of the word of God. Job is one of them. Where you can be richly blessed physically by money and still honor God with everything. Job was a very rich man. But Jesus makes this note because money has a way of influencing us. And at the end of the day, God is saying, look, your money can't buy you into heaven. Hello, somebody. Money doesn't get you to heaven. And yet many ministers become more lovers of money, even when they were once righteous and on fire for God. What the Word of God is saying the past righteousness of that righteous person who now become wicked, who's now a lover of money, you can't serve two masters, Jesus says. You either love one and uh, deny the other, but you can't, have one, you can't have both. You can't love God and love money at the same time. You can't do it. God is saying in the book of Ezekiel, I don't care how much righteousness you uh, did, how much good works you did. We can't even be saved by our works. But God is saying that I don't care how much previous righteous things that you've done. But because you became wicked later in life. And you stayed wicked and you didn't repent and turn from your wickedness. That person who once was righteous is destined to hell fire. This speaks of the grace of God. This speaks of... No matter how dirty we think we are, God, if we truly repent, God will heal us and help to turn us from our unrighteousness and keep us in his will so that life can be eternal for us. Amen. Amen. I hope that uh, today's message found you well and... Um, really help to encourage you to quicken your response to repentance. Allow that to become part of your lifestyle. Communicate that to your children. You may not know the fullness of the Bible, but if you're a man in your household, you're the head over your house, and you don't have much Bible, let me tell you something. The best thing you could do right now is to start teaching your children how to repent, that, that, that God will... Cover your sin. And I don't care if you do that thing five times in the day, ten times in the day, every time you sin against God and you knowingly did, don't wait to repent. But let His grace help to heal you. Let His grace help to turn you. Let His grace make you stronger to resist 
temptation. Look, we're all tempted. Jesus was tempted for 40 days before his ministry started when he fasted. He thought and was tempted just like us. That means you think of something that you're not supposed to do. That's tempting. But Jesus was a perfect example. We're not perfect. But he gives us a perfect tool that by his blood through repentance, we turn from our unrighteousness. He will forgive us. Amen. Let us pray out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you encourage us with the word. Your word is truly active and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. It helps to bring conviction that we come into compliance with your word. And Lord, your grace is so sufficient that you even, you, you, you're graceful with it. You're not quick to anger, the word of God says. You are slow to anger. That means that even when we don't know we're doing a thing, that your grace is covering us even in our ignorance. Father, your light shines as we get into your word. It's a lamp unto our feet here today, Lord. Encourage your children. Encourage me to maintain what I preach. I use myself. And what I preach today regarding repentance, that it would stick into the hearts of your sons and daughters listening, Father. Encourage us to adopt a lifestyle of repentance, to tap into your grace whenever, whenever, how many times we need you, Lord, help to quicken us, to be encouraged, not to go shamefully before your throne, but boldly before your throne, to ask you for your mercy and grace, so that your grace can supernaturally help us and strengthen us and turn us and teach us so that we can have eternal life in heaven. Father God, we thank you here. We give you all the glory here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And until next time, brothers and sisters, God bless you. Pastor Kevin Quelchow, Rodriguez, Living on the Rock Ministries. We love you. God bless you.